now that we kind of understand uh, monitoring and surveying kind of how those pieces fit together, we'll move ahead into, into kind of eliminating common errors. Um, <clears throat> as I said, with monitoring, you're not just setting up one time and taking a single snapshot of, of locations. What you're doing is measuring the same series of, of targets or locations over and over and over again. And so the, the system is inherently dynamic, whether it's going to be changing atmospheric conditions. Um, we'll go through what that looks like. Uh, another source of error is geometric. And so if you have like poor backside geometry or if all of a sudden you're missing backsides or one is moving, uh, these are things you need to take into account. Uh, site noise is something that can really affect our measurements. So whether it's going to be things like blocked backsides, changing of line of sight, uh, equipment kind of moving around the area, vibration, influence the total station, all those different kind of things. Uh, and then finally, getting into the idea of structural variance as well. Uh, this is something that I think doesn't get taken into account until the monitoring is active uh, because every structure, again, has, has natural variance. We want to really make sure we understand that before we're going through and reporting on these super fine tolerances. Uh, so atmospheric error uh, is, is one of the biggest influences, but thankfully it's one of the ones that we can also eliminate fairly easily. Uh, so total stations, as I said before, simply measure angle and distance. Uh, the thing that atmospheric error is gonna really mess with is that distance measurement. Uh, so total stations use an electronic distance measurement or uh, an EDM. And what they do is they, they use the speed of light, which is usually a known constant. Uh, and they use precise timing as well. So as soon as there is, um, the, excuse me, so you, you take the laser from the EDM and you measure to the target and get some return and you measure the time that that laser takes to get to the target and bounce back. And from that, you can calculate the distance. Uh, with monitoring, because we're, we're measuring in a changing environment, um, as we measure through the air, uh, at one point in time, it's got a certain density. And so it has a specific speed of light. And then as the temperature, as the pressure, as the humidity changes, that speed of light changes. And so the time that it takes the laser to get back from the target to the total station, or I should say from the total station to the target and back, um, is going to change. And it's going to it's going to look like a change in our distance if we don't account for the change in the speed of light. Uh, luckily, all of the Trimble equipment, so whether you're doing semi-automated or, or automated measurements, are going to capture the temperature and pressure at any one time for the measurement, or I should say at the time of measurement. That way, the speed of light can be adjusted, and then a lot of that atmospheric variance can be accounted for. Uh, there's also ways with automated systems to introduce humidity sensors. Uh, humidity has a, a fairly large influence on the uh, on the atmospheric error as well. So taking those those weather measurements and that humidity measurement, introducing it to the corrections that can also help eliminate uh, a source of error. So something that can happen is if you're if you're measuring through uh, changing air conditions. So especially if it's going to be changing over long distances. Uh, so for example, um, we have uh, excuse me. Uh, if you're measuring a long distance over like an open pit mine or in tight urban environments, what you can have is, is rapidly changing uh, air temperatures and air conditions. So we have one section of hot air, one section of cold air. Uh, what that really looks like is, is a, you have the known distance to the monitoring prism, which is measured kind of at that first measurement. And so the actual distance is going to be this dotted line here. When you're measuring with, with optics through air, uh, especially when you have changing air, the, the laser can refract uh, depending on the air densities. And so that can change kind of that measured distance to the monitoring prism. And this is going to change pretty dramatically depending on the air conditions. So at night, it's going to be this straight line because we have one consistent temperature. Uh, but during the day where we have differential heating of the ground and different refraction and, and reflection kind of effects from the environment, we're going to have a, a really different medium that we're measuring through. And so this distance might always be changing. So if this is changing by, you know, two centimeters throughout the day, it's going to look like this prism is moving back and forth. When in reality, this might just be sitting still and doing nothing, but you're measuring a distance change on it. Uh, so to reduce that error and to really understand what's going on, what we can do is introduce uh, a backside in the same area. So a fixed point that we can use as, as kind of a, a guide to understand how much that refraction is changing. Uh, T4D has a way to automatically do these calculations, but the, a very simple way that it works is that we're measuring the, the perceived offset or the, the change in distance because of these, these refractions through the air to this backside. And then we're applying that, that similar offset to the monitor position. Uh, it's not as simple as, a, as uh, a sum or just reducing the error by subtracting some change. What it does is it measures the change on the backside and knows how much that, that atmosphere is influencing that measurement. And then it runs that change through the least squares adjustment through the network adjustment using the rest of the backsides and all the monitoring prisms. And then applies some sort of scaled offset to the monitoring target. And that can account for quite a bit of that, that atmospheric error. So the vertical refraction can definitely play a role in, uh, in how things are measured, but it is a little bit more I guess, rare to come across it, a little bit more application-based. Perfect. So now I'm going to introduce the uh, idea of geometric error. Uh, and this is really the idea that a bad backside geometry, whether that's a bad setup or moving backsides, is going to mean bad results. Um, 
bad backsites might not have as big of an effect in standard survey workflows. Uh, I mean, I know that that bad coordinates obviously are going to affect your, your end results. Uh, but specifically when you're monitoring, this is really going to introduce a lot of noise in your displacements uh, and really turn into poor results, which make a, a whole lot of different headaches down the road. Um, first, I'll kind of show the, the good geometry. So the example that I'll be using for, for most of the presentation is, is this station setup plus where we have a, a fixed total station and then three good backsites. And then this is a good geometry because the backsites are at similar uh, orientations and distances, similar locations to the monitoring points. Um, another way that we reduce atmospheric error and really any error in the measurements is by having the backsites um, treated as fixed points. That way, if something changes in the measurement, the uh, this, the software, whether it's Trimble Access Monitoring or T40, <clears throat> is kind of able to, to measure that and take it into account. And so when you're using your backsites and setting them up around your region of influence, your monitoring targets, you want to make sure that they're essentially surrounding the site. So they're at similar distances and similar angles to your monitoring targets, uh, as close as you can get realistically, because obviously you don't want to mount your prisms too close to the zone of influence that they might be moving and introducing a new set of error. But you want to make sure that you're surrounding the area with with your with your back sites. Uh, another example here of good geometry we have uh, instead of a station set of plus, we have the resection. So the total station is in the zone of influence and we have our back sites surrounding the monitoring zone. Uh, here we want to just introduce uh, additional back sites because the total station is no longer at a known position. Uh, and so every time we're running the round, we're recalculating that total station coordinate. And so we want to make sure we have at least four back sites, five if you can, uh, six is always great. Um, but really introducing more back sites so that we have, again, more known points and you can do the math a little bit easier. Uh, bad geometry, and this is something that unfortunately we see more than we would like, is running a resection off of two back sites. Uh, this is probably totally fine for a standard survey workflow because you're, you're measuring one time. Uh, but in a monitoring world, we want more redundancy and we want more of a, a quality check. Um, so as we go through, if you're measuring and resecting off of, of two back sites, uh, if you recall from, from earlier in the presentation, uh, you're going to have a lot more error introduced because you don't have a quality check on your coordinates. Uh, and then more important, or not more importantly, but equally as important, I should say, is there's no redundancy in this setup. Uh, because when you're measuring in a monitoring situation, there's always, you know, things moving. And if you have uh, a truck parked in one of the back sites, you're not going to be able to uh, calculate the coordinate of the total station, get an orientation, measure any, any of your monitoring targets. And so a really simple thing in the field, like somebody blocking a back site, can take down the whole monitoring project. And if the monitoring is a, a crucial part of whatever you're doing, it's gonna shut down the whole site. So you always wanna use more back sites when you're doing a resection. Uh, another example of bad geometry here, we have uh, a fixed total station or a total station at a known point. So this is a station set of plus with three back sites. Uh, should be fine, right? Because we have enough back sites for the quality checks. Uh, the total station is at a known point, nothing's in the zone of influence. Um, but what we have here is, is the back sites are not at a similar uh, distance or angle as the monitoring targets. And so that introduces a lot of error because we're not measuring through the same medium um, as the monitoring prisms. So if you think about this, this prism right here in the middle, uh, maybe it's measuring a third of the distance uh, to the back site as it is to the monitoring site. So if we have a, a half millimeter of error on the measurement to the prism here, which is a, a pretty, I would say, pretty good amount of error, like a very acceptable. Um, if we extrapolate that and multiply it by the distance here, so you know half a millimeter at a third of the distance becomes a millimeter and a half at three times the distance. Uh, very crude math, probably not really the way that it works, uh, but just just for uh, yes, a thought process. Uh, all of a sudden, we're introducing a bunch of unnecessary error on this uh, setup because we have the ability to measure much more accurately, but because we're not measuring at a similar distance, we're not really accounting for that error there and just propagating the error through all of the different um, uh, measurements there. Uh, another example of bad geometry is adding multiple backsides to the same orientation. So here we might think that we're okay because we have four backsides uh, with our known total station coordinates. So if we think about it from the station setup plus point of view, four backsides, fixed total station should be great. Uh, but here, because everything's so close together, these aren't really adding any redundancy, any quality checks, or any, any ways to reduce error to the system. So this is really identical uh, mathematically or from our perspective uh, as a station setup with uh, two back sites. So adding multiple back sites doesn't help. It might help in terms of redundancy. And so if you have, you know, an area where these are close together, one is low down, one is high up, uh, kind of mounted on like a, the same pillar. If one is blocked and then it's visible and the other one is blocked and the other one is visible, that might help a little bit. Uh, but it's really better to find a new location for it altogether that's not going to be blocked uh, and really just introduce a, a good geometry there again. So not just two here and two here, but one here, one here, and one here. 
Uh, I also want to introduce the idea or, or talk about, I should say, the idea of the moving backside. Uh, so this is something that we see not fairly often, but we do see it occasionally where a backside moves and it looks like the rest of your monitor prisms move. Uh, with monitoring, with surveying, with everything, uh, these backsides are always treated as the fixed points. And again, all of the displacements are relative to these fixed points. And so if, for example, you have one of your backsides moving north, it's going to appear as if the rest of your backsides are moving south relative to that point because the system thinks that that backside is fixed. And so if that moves, it looks like the rest of the, the survey is moving the other direction. Uh, it's something that is easily preventable uh, and kind of easy to pick out. So if you see displacements all in one direction of similar magnitude, it usually means that you have a moving backside. Um, moving on from geometry now into kind of the, the idea of site noise. And so site noise is another major factor in, um, in your error. Uh, most commonly, we see equipment blocking line of sight to prisms or targets, whatever they may, might be. Uh, a lot of times, this is going to be something like a, a truck or a crane or people walking around or trash or litter floating around and just blocking prisms. Most of the time, that's not going to be a huge deal. It's easy to, to understand that prisms are blocked occasionally when you're monitoring every hour. It's kind of the nature of it that you're going to miss some measurements. Uh, but the problems that we really see are when we start to block the back sites. And so if you're running around where you have, you know, station set plus fixed total station and three back sites, if you miss one of those measurements and you have two back sites, uh, it's going to be a change in your geometry and then it's going to be a change in your results. Um, so even if everything's static and everything's not moving, and you have really low error and you do miss one back site, all of a sudden the calculations and the way that everything was done before is different. And so you're going to get going to get slightly different results. Uh, another source of noise is, is really common is vibration, especially around the total station. So the total stations are you know, they're very robust, they're IP65, especially the S-series that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, they're designed to be running in the field and operating 24-7, especially in these monitoring projects. But they are sensitive pieces of equipment, especially when you're talking about the high-precision EDMs and the half-second angular accuracy. If there's vibration in the area, it can really affect the measurement that that total station is taking. So something to take into account, if there's going to be vibration and compaction, you can still measure, but you need to understand that there is going to be some more error there and your, your measurements aren't going to be as accurate as they were before. Uh, another big source of it's I'm not going to call it error because it is a real measurement and a real displacement and real movement that you're measuring. Uh, but the idea of kind of natural variation in your structure, uh, and this is where the idea of setting up early and taking measurements often is really going to help. Uh, so, for example, I live in a hundred year old house and it's moving uh, quite a bit every year. So through the seasons, it probably changes an inch and a half. So my drywall is cracking in certain places and stuff. And that's just kind of inherent because the temperature swing here is, is so extreme. Um, if you think about a railway application as well, so a rail is just a big piece of long iron um, that can be baking in the sun all day long and then freezing at night. That's going to move uh, centimeters, maybe up to a half an inch or an inch throughout the day. Uh, if your tolerances for the project or your thresholds uh, are down to the hundredth of a foot, you're really going to be very accurately measuring the variance in that railway. Uh, and so even though it's moving in its natural way, so it's, it's shifting and changing as it always does, uh, because you're measuring it probably for the first time with this frequency and this uh, data resolution, uh, you're really going to be seeing a lot of natural variance. So it's it's very important to understand what you're measuring and kind of what uh, influence it already has before there's any sort of outside influence um, on that on that structure. So if you're monitoring a building or a railway, you want to measure it before construction starts, understand what happens, and then as that construction goes through, you can see that daily variance. And so instead of reporting on, you know, round to round variance or hour to hour variance where you might see a lot of change, what you're going to want to observe is that kind of daily variation, that sine wave pattern of the displacements. And then as that slowly shifts over time, if that's settling and settling and settling, then you're going to know that that is something, uh, something uh, on site that is actually causing that movement. 